Shrieker Magazine celebrating 25 years as the number one media platform from our city. And here we have a famous local, national and international pioneer of black comedy in theatre. This man, for 29 years, has been putting, on, putting bombs on seats. 29 years with his own um, upfront comedy empire and has made, has been famous for many reasons and we're going to go through that, okay, throughout the show. We have the legendary John Simi. How you doing, man? This is new Simi that I'm legendary. <laughs> <laughs> My mum would be like, hey, you bring me soap? <laughs> yeah, so it's different levels, isn't it? And so on, but yes. I'm not really walking around thinking, I am a legend. I'm thinking, what's my shopping list? Oh, I've got to take that bag to get the um, the zip fix. This is this is my day. It's a Tuesday. And so, so. <laughs> you know, it's not not quite P. Diddy. He said that to P. Diddy. He <laughs> believes that and lives on that. I'm like, how much time before I have to go, go get my bag fixed? But yes, uh, most of that is true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. John Simmick, man. Mm. Uh, wow. 29 years, putting bombs on seats. Mm -hmm. Approaching 30, exactly. The Approaching 30, so there's a big anniversary for the mm -hmm. that's, that's coming. I want to go back to, um, I want to talk about inspiration, John, first yeah. of all. Um, where, how, how did you get inspired to be a comedian? <laughs> Who and what inspired you to be a comedian, first and foremost? That's actually funny, because I used to say jokingly, but oh, there's truth in those jokes, that, those of us doing comedy, we couldn't box, run fast, or sing. <laughs> you know, that's what we're the guys. You know, I mean, you know, if we do, if we could do something else, we wouldn't be doing this. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> we love it because we're the guys and girls at schools. So well, all of us at school, you know, the usual thing. We there's banter, and some of it, some of us are better at it than others. But yeah. you still have to be a bit weird to think, well, I can go onto a stage in front of people mm. who have no idea where I am and try and make them laugh and so on. Wow. There's got to be a jump, and I think my thing came from the sound system. Which is ironic because those are the days when you had you had one turntable in before the two the two turntable era. So the mic man had more time between tunes. You could build a personality and build a, a little bit of a rep as well as hopefully being able to spit some lyrics. <laughs> Obviously, you could give the, you were the personality of the sound as well as the selector who whatever style he or she chose. Your your voice was that. So that was my start. And then years later, I realised that a number of people in in, in the UK game from Slim to Quaku. Wayne Wallings, I'd all come through sound systems, so sound right. system. It's a, and if you think about everybody from Soul to Soul to Trevor Nelson, sound system certainly in the 70s and 80s was a creative background because obviously there was no obvious way to get out, of, out there if you were. If you weren't a singer, and often even if you were a singer, Maxi Priest, Peter Spence, all these guys, etc., came through sound system, the male singers anyway, so um, the sound system was your way forward, but when I then became working in the arts, how I got started with, with organising things is often the case. It's just, I saw there was Birmingham Comedy Festival going to be happening way back in 1992, and I approached them to say, I've seen your, the pre adverts about your event. It would be great to do a really big black show at the Alexander Theatre as part of your events. And I always said these guys gave me a real push in the right direction because they said, oh, no, that wouldn't work. And I, I've got so much respect for them because until that moment, if you think about it, I was working in marketing. I was, a, I was an arts council trained right. marketeer. So I, was, I already marketed shows for other people. But until that moment, I hadn't, hadn't occurred to me to put on my own show because my job was marketing for other people and performing. But that's the light bulb moment when you're thinking, because you've written this down, you've written out your proposal. Yeah. And when they said, no, you still, you look at it, no, this is a good idea, this will still work. So I hired the Alexander Theatre, which, since it's 1992, it was quite a pricey thing to do, but I think the arts was, was in quite a good situation at the time. Mm. But it's just believing it wasn't like I'm going to show you. It's like, that's a good idea. I'll do it myself. Yeah, right. And you know, it worked. Yeah. And the thing is, many people know when it's your own money, <laughs> you're risking. You know where every penny's gone. So we sold 996 tickets. Wow. I would say what 800 of them in the last in the last 10 days. That's after three months. Wow. So you know, your your black audience will see, <laughs> see the flyer, see the flyer, hear the advert, see the flyer, hear the advert. Yeah. Blah 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 blah, and then. It's like somebody blows a whistle because it's like with two weeks ago we've done about two hundred. I know the Alexandra holds fourteen hundred, or just under. Because I remember thinking this could be quite embarrassing, you know, mm. not so much a financial thing, but you know, you mm. want the place. But and then that's, like, that was more important, wasn't it? Yeah, it looks good and it's full. <laughs> and then, it's like somebody blows a whistle. Okay, now we'll buy our tickets because the last ten days or so, it just went like that. Yeah, sell, sell, yeah. sell. But. I think, hang on, you guys knew about the show for three months. Do you think maybe at the time, people, the reason why it probably took so long 
was because it was a brand new thing for people. And Some it was of a that shock, is true. A shock to the system as well. Some of that is true. Is this course. really happening? And also, as is it, it really happening? Event, event, your friends are saying, oh, well, everyone is going. Well, I was getting my tickets. My, yeah. my crew is going. My, you know, my family is going. Family and friends are going. Oh, that's it's a bank holiday Sunday. So, uh, I mean, it's changed to a degree now. You can sell tickets more in advance. But I think that's where you used to have things like making the, the which people still do making the advance price ticket lower than the actual price to try and get people to decide. Because sometimes someone knows they're going. Three, it's, they might see it in, in April and thought, oh, that's, it, that, that's in October, I'm going yeah, to that. Yeah. <laughs> but they're booking their tickets in September. Or as a showman at the moment, which is ending its tour, it's called Rush, it's a Windrush musical, which is doing really well everywhere. Yeah. And wow. that ends the 21, 20, 21 tour in Wolverhampton, the Grand Theatre. And that sort wow. of sold out to two middle, the bottom and middle section, and there's just a handful of nosebleed seats where you're looking down on the tops of our heads. But I bet some of the people are still going to try and book the last minute. What do you mean it's sell out? Because <laughs> other people book before. No, no, no. <laughs> I, and I don't know if it's a black thing. It might, other, other cultures might be able to say, have the same experience. But you have mm. friends ringing you up and cursing you like, what do you mean it's sell out? Well, that's what, that's what box office have told you. <laughs> That's what, what am I supposed to do? It's, like, it's almost like, what's his name? Um, Only Fools are Horses, Dale Boy. Like, you're going to open your jacket and you've got a row of tickets which you've, you've held back. <laughs> and also, we're not selling the tickets. The theatre's selling the tickets, you know what I mean? So, yeah, anyway. Of yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. But you know what? The, this, 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 I need to talk about theatre a lot. I mean, I, I see you got a lot of press attention. You, you got a lot of press attention for um, putting black people on the map in theatre because basically you, you had a frustration didn't you of um, seeing that black comedians was just in pubs and well, towards, oh, a smaller place I mean a lot of our white counterparts were in pubs yeah in, above pubs in the, in the function rooms and mm. so on and as is the case with any new comedian at the time you have to ring up and they're sort of oh, yeah, ring us in three months or whatever it is and you're to get into comedy or you, you do an open mic you know like to a degree like with singing but with singing you've got a voice or you haven't got a voice with comedy you've got to learn on the job mm -hmm. there's no other way about it because if you can sing you can make your voice a bit better but you've already got the voice mm -hmm. with comedy you've got to get on stage and learn how to work crowds and all that sort of stuff so it was about just taking a bit of control of your own destiny it's nice to be able to ring up someone and they'll take you on but why wait for that that was just that sense of why well, yeah. am I waiting for him yeah. Who's running his little? Thinks he's running his little empire above a pub room and so on going on like, I'll oh, ring back in three months. Well, why <laughs> to play your pub? You took it to another, you took it, you took it you took it to another level, um, way before social media. You've mm -hmm. done theatre tours. Yeah. It's all everything's been grand. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about like London, Birmingham, Manchester, all over the country. Literally every city, every city, every, city. every metropolitan city where there's like. And basically, public. you are the only one that had it in your hands. This theatre. Black it's comedy theatre toy. What the hell are you doing it? Yeah, it's not. Putting that. London on the map in Birmingham, if that makes or sense. Or vice versa, or whatever. Yeah, or it's like you're bringing them here. I, I think it's a quite a unique thing. That I I've think seen because you. at this twenty last six cents, even today, there's not many comedians who don't live in London or aren't from London. There's just a handful, and in their days, it was just me. You know, everybody else was from um, was from London, or if they weren't, in the case of someone like Roger D, who was from Manchester, they lived in London. Yeah. So of course, I just think it's having that perspective, the national perspective, because I was already on the road with theatre theater shows, thinking, well, this works down in London. And of course, I was going down to London to try and get shows and get yeah. on, onto bills. But I find that Bristol would want it. You know, Manchester, Leeds, Nottingham, Derby, Liverpool, Coventry, you name it, all these places, they want it. So one by one, you set up clubs over there. But it's because I was from London, maybe I had the national perspective, whereas the Londoners would have the North, South, East and West. Because lots going on in London, but not that much going outside. And when I say lots, not as much. but. What I do have to say is, having that national perspective, even though I'm from Birmingham, my first monthly club was in Sheffield, of all places, not Birmingham, because okay. they offered first. Mm -hmm. So I started out in Birmingham, and I was doing shows for other people. Mm -hmm. But the first deal I made was with the Crucible, where, which was known for the World Snooker Championships. That was a monthly club from there, and then a, a venue in West London, Yar Santua got in touch, and we started there. And then, you know, you're old when you're meeting people like Doc Brown, the rapper, <laughs> the rapper comedian, actor. Yeah. And he's saying the first comedy club he went to as a teenager was Upfront, because he's from West London. Wow. You know what I mean? And then even, what's his name? Um, oh, Akala, the rapper. Wow. He says, as a youngster, because you know, him and Miss Dynamite, his sisters, uh, their godfather is Offerman, who is still the techie to this day at Hackney Empire. So he says, well, as youngsters, 
I think they're from that side. I think are they from East. I think they're from East London. Yeah, they're in Europe. But I'm saying you're meeting these people. You have got so much time and respect and admiration for. They're going. Oh, I used to watch you when I was at school. Hey, eh? yeah. <laughs> was in the audience with our Godfather. Like, me too, John. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take you. But I remember me being um, um, aspiring young singer at 14 years old, mm-hmm. and um, you put me on upfront comedy tour. <laughs> I'm thinking I've got a signal. <laughs> Well, thank you for giving me that yeah, chance. But you have to put yourself forward in the first place. You know, no one's going yeah. to say, well, you know, I think I got So I, I remember you putting me, I was, I, mean, I was devastated, but it was, a, it was a, a fantastic experience. You put me in London, you put me in Birmingham, and I'm like, wow. So yes, Upfront Comedy was my first um, show that I've been to. I performed, I performed at my first Upfront Comedy experience. Uh, and, 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 and thank you for that, John. That's quite all right. The, the, the thing is, a lot of us come from, like I said before, from sound systems. So when you start to organise music, obviously your passion, sorry, comedy, your passion is still music. So you're thinking, well, we'd have guests, we've got guests, but I mean, God, the amount of people who've appeared on our stages in the musicals, from Omar to Kelly and the Rock, yeah. to the, the list is just a bit Roachford. Um, wow, Roachford. Yeah. All of these people have been guests. Um, um, I'm l- losing track, Top Cat the MC. Wow. It goes on UK Apache. If, if I think more, there'll be a lot, but all these people have been guests. In, on our comedy nights as well, yeah. etc. And obviously, a lot, most of them after they were known. It's not like they're, they're unknown. But if you talk about the the then unknown comedians who slept on my sofa over the years <laughs> when I was in Hansworth, and then lastly where I am now in North, North Birmingham, JB Smooth just won an Emmy. So I messaged him the other day. It was in the Spider-Man movie, and so my oldest daughter wow. remembers stepping over him sleeping on my sofa. That is crazy. The Patrice O'Neill, who I just wow. Really on, he's. Uh, you know what's weird about that? He, he passed away a few years ago, but he's, he's considered a comedy legend. I, think, well, I used to bring him to Birmingham, to the UK, and he'd be based in Birmingham. Mm-hmm. And I was walking from my daughter's house before lockdown. And you know, people have got, everyone's got their smart TVs. And I looked in someone's window while walking past, and I saw Patrice on the screen, and I knew what the program was, because it was paused. It was a Deaf Comedy Jam 25 year special. And someone was obviously watching it, which is then a new program on Netflix, I think 2019. And I thought, how weird is that? I didn't, I didn't stop, but I thought I could knock this person's door and, and, and say, you know, that, that comedian wow. who's on your screen, are you through? He, he used to stay 10 minutes up the road many times over the years. I'll be getting on the local train from North Birmingham, from Erdington to go into town to get his train around the country, etc., etc. So a lot of these people, they, yeah, they've re- reached X amount of status. These are your, your mates and so on. You can remember the sort of. The funny things and the annoying things about being on the road with them, they're still, you know, they're, they're human. So when you see, I mean, sadly he passed away early, yeah. but I, I was just look, looking at the current, um, people are talking about the Dave Chappelle special at the moment, and I just saw somebody do a thing where they said, oh, I prefer Patrice O'Neill or Big Bill Burr. Just before I was waiting to come in, I thought, there's Patrice again, I think, oh, oh, him. Who used, yeah. to, <laughs> <laughs> who used to eat me out of house and home. Wow. <laughs> so with Bridget and so on. But obviously, there was a weird thing about that because I remember starting to go to New York. I was, no, starting again. My father spent the last 20 years in New York of his life, so I got my green card in 83, so I was always going to New York anyway. So this was before comedy. I spent part of every summer with my parents. But once I started to do comedy and once I started to bring comedians over, the story behind that is basically in 93 at the Edinburgh Festival, which is every year. It's Obviously, it's a big workshop for comedy. Mm-hmm. It's a big showcase. There was two black shows that year. There was one called Stand Up Black America, which featured three comedians, one of whom became a good friend to this day, Ian Edwards. And there was another show called The Adventures of Trick Whitey Man, which was like a superhero, a black superhero, by a 19-year-old comedian called Dave Chappelle. So that year, there was only two black shows. Of course, there were... They were surprised to see any black people, because we come up from Birmingham to check out Edinburgh Festival, and, oh, there's two black shows, so of course they were glad to see us. We ate food and all that sort of stuff, hung out for a little bit and so on, but then Ian Edwards from the other show said, we'd like to come over. Mm. This is August 93, only a year after I'd started organising shows, and by March 93, just six months later, I'd organised my first tour. You don't realise what, at the time, is when you look back, because I had <laughs> all these, and they slept on my sofa in my flat in Hansworth, etc. Went to, to, took them off the plane in London, met them off the plane, Junior Simpson, comedian who's still around. Yeah. He drove us to the airport. Remember, I'd never met, I'd met Ian, but I didn't know Will Sylvins who's still around, and um, yeah. talent, met them off the plane, they did the first tour, and it grew, grew from there. And then some of the people I was bringing over, I mentioned you, JB Smooth and other people, but also, Gina, was, the Jeannie Asher raised and Well, Gina yeah. went the other way, because I produced yeah. her first tour. But what I'm saying, I suppose, is that for every all the stuff which 
went well. There's the little things where you're thinking, you could have done that better. Mm. Like an example, Mike Epps, who's obviously a very well-known comedian, I had him booked to come over, and then another comedian who, uh, who's, who's very well-known, well, well mentioned, Russell Peters, said to me, <laughs> <laughs> something along the lines. But you know anyway, what, though? It's about John Simmitt, man. Bro. What you have done, bro. No, my point is what I'm saying about, I didn't always get it right. <laughs> I counselled Mike Epps, it was, it was like, oh, they said, because you, know, you always have people around your family. They're mm. like, you know, you want, you, you want people to, and he, he hadn't done anything wrong without, you know, I said, oh, maybe another time. And mm. six months later, <laughs> he was in the sequel to Friday. Ah. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but, you know, at least you got, at least you got, this, That's what we are. Just made, just made like, you have to laugh at this, thing, you yeah. So it's never sitting around going like, I, oh, I thought of all of this and I knew, well, I'm thinking, you know how many mistakes I've made along the line and continue to make less than things you get right, but don't like go out there going on like, you know what I mean? Mike yeah. Epps. Did I just cancel him and now he's starting to, oh, he's in another movie, oh, he's in another movie, yeah, yeah. And logic had been, when you was in the New York comedy clubs in the mid 90s saying, some of these people are going to be very big over the years. You don't know who, but let's build some relationships in terms of regular work. And as they grow, you know, you've had that, really, that 10, 15, literally 20 year relationship in some cases and so on. But I was saying, you don't always get it right. Mm, <laughs> it's like yeah. that's a lot But you've got a lot of things right though, mate. And I'm telling you, John, John Simmitt, man, you, you know, 29 years in the business, um, being the pioneer of um, black comedy in theatre. Other people say that, so that's good. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, now I'm saying it's always good when newspapers say When newspapers, other people say that, rather than you say it yourself, because you know, some yeah, people yeah, go yeah. going, maybe. Uh, yeah, but um, I'll point to what other people say rather than what I'm saying. Got to like big it. up upfront comedy, the longest, stand, long, long, it's the longest standing platform, platform out, there. out there from Birmingham Virginia that's Virginia. made an international name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nationally, international. I continue to do so, and so even stuff like at the moment. I'm having a blast because I'm in a I'm in a, a a musical. I'm thinking, hang on, I can't sing. I'm like you, I can't sing. So when, <laughs> and again, they'd ask me to do some work, help them produce it, and get into more theatres. Then then the producer, I mean, Miller says, do you want to be in it? I'm like, hey, because I hadn't seen this at the time. I'm like, no, I mean, okay, I'll sing like a fool of myself. And he says, no, we need a narrator, which of course is a bit like comparing a like, comedy. Oh yeah, yeah. And then there wasn't much of a script. There was ideas of great songs and a great band. So you end up writing a lot of your, the narration yourself. So it's like sometimes you don't see these things coming, and you know a lot of next year is already taken care of. Yeah. You know because that this the show is ongoing. So we end in November twenty, November sixteenth at the Grand in Wolverhampton. We start again in February, at two nights at Liverpool Playhouse, three nights at Birmingham Rep. Wow. So it's coming local again. Wow. And it goes on. So it's nice to think. Oh well, most of next year, not every day till gone, but most of next year. You know, and that's. Nice because I'm not producing that one. You know, it's the one. nice to be able to turn up. When do you need me there? Because <laughs> you know, as an organizer, when you're organizing things, you can't just think about, right, I'm Mark Green, I'm on the bill as a singer in this case. Mm. I've got three songs to sing, but about this slot. Yeah. You're on the phone to it, but what time you get in? If it's all pros, it's good, but so and so's late, this, that, and the other, this hasn't arrived, so and so's arrived with the music in the wrong format, because you know that it's on CD, I've got a yeah. CD player, or it's on DAT, or all the sorts of technical, <laughs> all that sort of, I've had that be all this things yeah. from experience. <laughs> you, have to send, you have to send somebody out, for, that's oh when it, somebody out, you know, obviously, you ask people to be a couple of hours from the show so you can sort all that sort of out. Oh, with wow. Rush, I turn up and I, I perform, you know what I mean? So I haven't got to worry about everybody else getting there, I just have to get myself there on time. So it's nice wow. to do it both ways. For I've you. got to rewind back to when the fact that you that you you're, you're you're about putting people on the map. Even though you you know you've got you've got you, you use your platform to help people, mm. and I'm, I've got to put myself in there. You help me, and that's why when you put me on stage at 14, and then when I got into the position where I could, uh, when I had the magazine at 17, well I started the magazine at 17. Was it 17? I started it. Yeah, it was 17. You was my first interview in the Streaker I do, magazine. I do remember that. I do remember in the that. first edition. Right. And do you know that this is 25 years later since then? So, so then you're still there. So that's the what it's about. You'll get, you'll get, <laughs> well, it's a Tyson Fury thing. You're, you're going to get knocked down. All of us going to get knocked yeah. down. What was that, that song always? I'll get knocked yeah, down. Well, <laughs> that was, I just did a thing recently for Channel 5. It was, you know, the, the big songs of the 90s. You know, lots, you know, yeah. lots of talking heads. And yeah. all these tunes come up from the 90s. It was Mark Morrison, it was TLC, it was blah, blah, blah. And I used to say, well, that was my favourite tunes because you, you never heard anything like it. It's like a football chant. Huh? <laughs> it, it doesn't fit into a genre, but it's joyous, isn't it? And yeah. it yeah, it's so <laughs> stupid as well. Oh, get knocked down! <laughs> I think Todd, the comedian, does that. But I remember being in Miami in 98, the year after that, hit the charts. And the local theatre, what they call Chumba Wumbo, did that tune. Right. They, it's nice to see a British band, you know, you're walking around and on the marquee was their name. I'm like, what? Wow. Band from Sheffield. In, I mean, in Miami. Sheffield. And 
And obviously that become an international hit, probably their only big hit, but that tune took them all over the place. But it's, 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 a, it's a good motto, isn't it? I get knocked down. We all get knocked down from time to time, but hopefully we get up again. <laughs> that, 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 that was a shock, but what was a shock, um, John, as well? That shocked us was, wow, that's John Simmit in a Teletubbies outfit. Outfit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Listen. Outfit, I like that. That, that come on, man. I, I've never seen anything like that. That You know when some people, um, there's people that... Um, Follow trends and there's people that set them. You've set the standard, you know. No one's ever done that. You've <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking how much credit I can claim credit for Deep Sea because that was me, my moves and my voice. You're an amazing stuntman as well, aren't you? Yeah, well, that, that, not, that, not, that, for that. <laughs> not for hire. Not for hire. Anybody else will take their, their I'll take in my own lumps, put it that way. But yeah, the thing is, you can't plan some of this stuff because my point being, mm. a lot of the crew who worked on Teletubbies, if I remember right, they'd come off a thing called El Dorado, which I don't know if you remember, it was no. a British soap opera which would cost a lot of money because it was set and filmed in Spain. So that's a whole another level of investment. I think it was BBC because you've got to buy the land, build the sets, get everybody out there and then film the thing in Spain. But my point being about that one is that a number of the crew who were on Teletubbies had come off that because that show didn't work. So I think after about whatever, six or nine months, they decided to cut their losses, having spent a fortune setting it up and, and what have you. I remember thinking to myself, as a performer, if you'd been offered a choice of El Dorado or Teletubbies, anyone with a brain would have taken El Dorado because, mm-hmm. come on, man, it's a soap. Yeah. It's just launching, so there's a lot of money being put. And it's mm-hmm. abroad, so you'll be filming in Spain in the sunshine. Yeah. And obviously, the, the powers that be have put the next on the line, they really want this to work. Mm-hmm. Whereas, this is a preschool children's show. You'll be in the first suit. Not, not disparaging, you're thinking, well, mm-hmm. you're thinking, that's not going to go anywhere. Or it might be popular with the children and you're not going to be known. No, nobody knew that. I can't speak for El Dorado, but for whatever reason, it never took off. But you know, this 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 children's show was became an international phenomenon. And I mean, was it 123 countries and counting? Wow! Went everywhere. And I remember how it worked. I was the first person cast, and at the time, it didn't even have a commission. So it was Ragdoll Productions who made the show. One of three companies pitching to get this slot. I think something called Playboss had been was being discontinued, and they were obviously the BBC had said, "All right, guys, you you production company, what have you got?" So when I went for an audition, it was something called Telly Teddies. So it turned out that name later on had been registered by somebody else. Right. So that's how long down the road it was. They didn't even have a name. They had a rough, fake concept. And even then we tried to explain it to people. Like, I'm like, that sounds weird. If I was to say to you, I'm in this new show and we're like, space age toddlers <laughs> with televisions <laughs> in our screens. We don't say too much and we run around. That's except, bizarre, man. Ex- and, and the thing is, after months, once they got the commission and they said, we're yeah. going to cast the others and you're going to start rehearsals in London, that was in the start of 1996. And then after months in London of rehearsals, you're going to move on to Stratford and Avon, a bit closer to here, to start filming the show. I remember doing the first sketch and it's like being in a post box because you, you're looking for the most, so there's no peripheral vision. You've got an earpiece to help you along, blah, 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 blah. But I remember filming that sketch. And it always went I'm thinking, this is really strange. Even though I've been working for months, you know, you're in it. You're thinking, this is really out there. I remember thinking to myself, it's either going to go, you know. And then you put the Yardy twist to it and get, do, to, do the ball, got the whole to, nation doing the ball. <laughs> you introduced, listen, this, this is, listen, let's talk about the things you've done right, bro. Listen, you have influenced. But you, and, and, you they, can, and you can only be what you You can brought be. the Jamaican twang into the young, mm-hmm. um, because there's that truth. TV. You might even want to put it on later on um, in, in the edit. There's the also tune. Is it? Oh, is it the whip? By the Ethiopians. Yo, it's just a regular rhythm track. Boom, 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 boom. Like many MCs have wrote that. It's been adapted. Blah, 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 blah. I think it's the whip, if I remember rightly. But that's just what Dipsy's saying as he's walking along. Yeah. So if you think about culture. It's like Dipsy's riding that rhythm. Yeah. So, I me mean, as an old sound system MC, you can yeah. only bring your culture with you. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Uh, um, Jamaican Brummy. <laughs> so, when you've done that, when you brought that idea to the table, bringing the Jamaican Patois into <laughs> into the uh, character, was there any hesitation from it the production yeah, crew? Or did they just say, fair, go to with be it? fair, the producer, I remember, she came up with this weird right. <laughs> international right. sauce. She's a creative visionary, and Anne Wood and Andy <laughs> and Davenport. They're out there themselves. Because <laughs> when they explain to us, we're like, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Like, All right, then. Yeah, we'll, we'll give it a go. But what? But mm. So they, I mean, remember, it's two white cast members, one black and one Chinese. Mm. And they were asking, like, Poi, Poi Fan Lee, the actress who played Poe, she's also... 
putting her culture in there. Fad it, fad it, fad it. I can't remember what that means, but that's actually, actually words from that culture. And you think it went around the world, Brilliant. that's part of it. So children across the world are hearing their own voices and, and stuff Brilliant. reflected. And if you think about it, but certainly with poised heritage of the Chinese, there's more of them than anybody else in the world. So somebody was thinking this thing through in terms of um, let's touch all corners and, and, and children come in all shapes and sizes as they know. So they're just trying to ragdoll in all their shows. I've tried to reflect that. So yes, I take credit. Should. For, for my own contribution, <laughs> but I was encouraged by the producers who had vision. Yeah, know? but you did it, man. And, you know, it, I mean, that's the first time I've ever seen any Jamaican vibe mm. in a, tele, in a, in a, a kid's, a kids yeah. television show. Right. And since then, we've had, um, what's the, um, what's, is it, is the rap, what's the rap, what's the rap, the mouse? Rasta mouse, etc. That wouldn't have happened if they didn't think it could work for seeing Dipsy yeah. in Teletubbies. Do you I'm see where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. So you've created, you've start, you've set a trend here, bro. You can only do what you can do. Because put it this way, I'm not David Harewood or one of these great actors. Because I'm a stand up and a DJ. You know what I mean? Some guys like David Harewood, these are actors with range. You know what I mean? Mm. Who can give you the dramatic and, and Eddie Nessa can give you it. A lot of my friends are really good actors and so on. I'm aware of my strengths and limitations. I can't just you spit on all that. No, nothing's wrong with that. Doesn't mean yeah. I'm. But I'm no. This is what I can do. It. He's like you've only got the tools you can bring to this head. Yeah. Day, but you know what I mean? Um, thank you, know, you sound system man mm, thank you yeah. sound system think of how many of us got, got performing experience from that because obviously if somebody puts a mic in your hand to do stand up we will say it's, it's one of the great jobs like anything else if you sing and they respond well if you've sung well and they've gone for it greatest feeling in the world if you haven't sung well or you've just not connected same with comedy some nights you go out there and you're the king other nights the only laugh you can hear from the other comedians backstage behind you because they know these are the jokes which normally tear down the place or oh, get it and they're laughing because they're probably about to come out and have a bad time too but i'm saying it is very much like bare knuckles you are microphone in a crowd wow. you know what i mean so it's a scary thing, particularly for the newest comedians, but at least a number of us of my generation, before we'd ever gone on a stand-up stage, we'd been on the mic for years on sound systems. Obviously. Look at what's come out of sound system. John mm -hmm. Simmick, Upfront talk Comedy, to, International, to B going into bloody um, Teletubbies now. All over, and, and learning to promote Jazzy it. Jazzy B, sold to up. Yeah. yeah, it's true. You're right People when you mentioned Trevor Nelson, Jazzy B. Sound system's really important. And yeah, they're 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 your ears off about their sound system. It's a serious definitely. topic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's it's done a lot for the country. How did how did you take being called Dipsy instead of John? Because so, well, a lot of people like to call you like, well, did it ever get to you or did you? Nah, you know what, as long, long as Dipsy's paying money, I call <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm waiting for! <laughs> you can't be Dipsy, I'm getting paid for being Dipsy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I, I, I call Dipsy my furry godfather, which is what he is, where he's like, it's a gift that keeps on giving, so you know what I mean? So, you know, if people want to call me that, feel free. You know what I mean? I can live with it. It's a successful project, so what? Legendary comedian, stunt man. <laughs> You're stunt man. Man, man. Tell me some of the... the, the, the I, I was covered in for a free stoner for a very well padded, so... In fact, there's a stand-up joke, a stand-up routine I used to do. Um, <laughs> about nearly getting into a fight, we're doing a, a photo session in Paris on the street, so some guy just walking, it was just my, you know, usually you're just walking past money zone, and decides to slap it, and I slapped him back, it's a long story, but I'm in a Teletubby suit, so my logic was, there's no way you're winning this fight, you might think, you know, you might just be walking down the road, you're and I, you see, I tell you, you slap him, and when the Teletubby slaps you back, you're and backing off, so what are you going to do now, because, uh, you know, because I'm, Bridget, I'm covered in fur. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rap with Dipsy. Take, take your best shot between the legs and I can take that. But my shot is going to do you. And people are watching and you're with your boys on a Parisian street. My money's on the telly. <laughs> That's one of the most bizarre things I remember thinking. Because he didn't mean it. Like, Sorry enough, I was walking by, but, but we're from Burma. You don't put your hands on my clothes. That's why I like, what? Oh, <laughs> and I'm in the suit. <laughs> oh. oh, legendary man. They got to John Simmy for presenting the first ever Street Cred Magazine Awards in 1999. Also at the Grand Hotel and the Street Cred second anniversary awards at the Hyatt Hotel. John Simmons it's a legend, man. You remember more than I do. What I know, I'm <laughs> to remind you. <laughs> 29 years of putting bombs on seats. John Simmons, Street Cred 29th 